Well, I think we could probably go ahead and get started. Um, your program says that my name is uh, Julie Lau, which is not correct. Uh, my name is uh, Lou Rudanovich. Uh, uh, I'm with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I happen to be the Deputy Director of the Respiratory Health Division at NIOSH. Uh, I do want to thank Julie, uh, who's with the uh, National Academies, who is instrumental. It's on. It's on. Really close? Better? I want to thank Julie, who's with the National Academies, uh, for brokering uh, this uh, session at the last second. I uh, also want to thank David and colleagues at Columbia for allowing it to happen. Uh, the idea here is that we would have a, a, a bit of a, a, a different approach uh, where we will uh, serve as a roundtable with the explicit instructions that no one was allowed to bring slides. Uh, and it can be hard for scientists. Uh, but so this is just verbal uh, communication. Uh, so what we want to do is uh, do very brief introductions uh, and an offering of perspective uh, among the participants about uh, the regulatory uh, structure or lack thereof uh, for uh, UV uh, in the US. Uh, and then save, if we can, 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this session uh, to talk about uh, or to take questions uh, from the audience. And we'll ask that to be uh, an amiable uh, exchange, uh, as we know that some of these issues are, are very pressing and important to, to many of you. Uh, so I will just say uh, again that uh, I, representing the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, uh, NIOSH in the US is charged with uh, studying uh, occupational safety and health. Uh, and uh, we seek to advance knowledge, gain new information, and then apply it to the workplace uh, in practice uh, settings. And so my perspective here is that uh, this is uh, ex very exciting uh, technology and it's uh, been uh, fascinating uh, to read all the, the wonderful science that's evolved, especially over the last 10 years with 222. Uh, and I wanna thank the many who've contributed to that and all the uh, immense uh, theoretical work that's occurred here uh, at the university, uh, at Columbia University. We seek uh, on behalf of NIOSH to see that this uh, terrific science is applied in a safe way, as I know all of you do as well. So I would like to pass it to uh, Eileen and then down the line and uh, we'll ask them to introduce themselves and uh, share their perspectives. We'll then come back to Eileen if we could at the end, uh, and she will talk about uh, FIFRA and some of the, the regulation that does exist. Okay, so my name is Aileen Heffernan. Um, I work at EPA in the Office of Pesticide Programs, uh, particularly the Antimicrobials Division, and I am the chair of the Device and FIFRA Jurisdiction Work Group. Um, so if you have a device, um, which typically UV lights are devices, um, and you have a question on how you're regulated, your email gets routed to me. Um, and I answer all of all of the emails that come in. Um, and I uh, work with multiple different parts of EPA to make sure that um, determinations are made correctly um, and uh, help, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, and help make sure that there's an even playing field among device manufacturers. Cameron? So I'm Cameron Miller. I work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, my primary focus over the years has been just optical radiation measurements, specifically photometry. So when you go into the hardware store and you buy a light bulb and it says X lumens, that's my job. Um, <clears throat> part of our group, we measure from four nanometers to 2,500 nanometers. So obviously, far UV and UVC fits into that window. Um, we are working on making better measurements and scale realizations. Um, I will point out if you were at Mike Clark's and he quoted that PTB does their deuterium lance at 6%, we do ours at 1%. It's a very different process that we do. So we are, it's, it's part of the uh, National Metrology Institute Olympics type of things that we do. Um, with respect to the, what's going on here, um, this, we need to, from a documentary standards point, from the front 
to the end, we have to have all these threads going at once. And what I mean is we have to have standards that are developing that measures how many photons a product can put out. And working in the Illuminating Engineering Society, we've been working on those uh, standards. And as was mentioned earlier, LM93 for far UV devices is out at the component level. We need some sort of consensus standard that says how many photons we need at a minimum to do the job. Um, there is tons and tons of literature out there, but we need a consensus body to say, I need X amount. Then you get into more of the engineering and the application, which is a lot of the discussion that I saw in the last couple of days, is now what factors influence, you know, what, how much more tolerance do I have to put on that to mitigate potential soilants, different things going on, humidity in the room. What am I trying to achieve? Um, and these get into more of a risk approach. And then you end up with application gu guidelines where the engineer, some qualified individual, can actually implement this and create a space that is safe and does its job. And then you need that maintenance and validation. And NAMCO, as we mentioned earlier, is working on educating and certifying folks that can come in and do this third-party analysis. So we need to keep working on all of these facets. But one of the things that I think is really lagging is the engineering you know, the recommended practices just by what we saw in the last couple of days. So just one person can't do it. It's got to be entire teams of people push these all these facets forward. And then uh, to Richard, who in this context is representing ASHRAE, if you can't see the small print. Right. So um, I'll just give you a little antidote. Uh, my first job in New York City I was working at the research arm of the Illuminating Engineering Society, and I opened the desk drawer where I was assigned, and there inside was Lukash's um, germicidal UV, and it was also a guideline from GE on how to apply upper room UV systems. And so this was uh, all done in the 30s and the 40s, a lot of the science that we're rediscovering in many ways and fast forward to, uh, to uh, the late uh, 80s, and there was a TB outbreak when I was directing the Lighting Research Institute. This is relevant to ASHRAE, but I'll get to that in a moment. And uh, I was contacted by Phil Brickner at St. Vincent's Hospital because in the 50s, upper room UV systems were applied at Bellevue Hospital for active TB wards. They had no antibiotics, they had no vaccines, nothing. They just were treating people on those wards and they wanted to keep the uh, staff safe. And so they hung uh, UV lights in those uh, active TB wards. Fast forward to the 80s, antibiotics had been discovered. And so they took down the lights. They took down all the know-how about how to do this. And then in the 80s, when TB started reoccurring here in an uptick in the United States, there were drug resistant strains of TB which didn't, uh, the antibiotics weren't able to really treat. And this is what we're finding more and more with tuberculosis. It's becoming more and more drug resistant and it's become a major issue globally. And so we began a study with the Harvard School of Public Health to reapply upper room UV. We contacted all the government agencies at the time to review the science about how well uh, UV worked. It was thought to be very effective. And there was just a question then, how do you apply it? Because buildings had changed from the 40s and the 50s where you had very high ceilings to allow natural daylight to come into buildings as well as uh, ventilation by opening up windows and using radiators for heating the rooms. So we had to rethink how to do this where you have air conditioning systems where the maybe two feet of the 10 foot uh, height got uh, sucked up with all the mechanical space above uh, the ceiling. So we had to really look at how do you characterize all these uh, systems? And then we learned how to apply it. And so what I've been doing uh, for the last um, 20 years within ASHRAE is trying to marry this technology with ventilation because we know that you can't do UV without ventilation. And so we really needed to have a technical society that would begin to embed this in uh, to standard practice. And so that's been the role uh, 
ASHRAE's uh, TC 2.9 is looking at all germicidal systems for in-duct as well as uh, in-room uh, type of applications. And my role has been to really look at how do we do that um, with upper room. Right now, we're writing the guidelines. Uh, one of the advances we've had is that we've, um, through the CIE and the Illuminating Engineering Societies, we have um, practices by which uh, this equipment can be tested and compared on an equal basis. So we now have uh, a way that the industry ha and UL ha have responded to be able to test equipment. And so that's available. We have uh, computer systems will allow us to calculate the irradiance in rooms. And so a lot of this has happened just as a response to applying it without necessarily having regulation. We're taking uh, some of the ACGIH, they hear from uh, Dave Sliney and others, things that are readily available and applying those within the practice. And so at this point, I don't really see a need for uh, regulatory um, uh, aspects within this uh, um, at this point, but uh, we can talk about that. Thanks, Richard. And then David, if you cannot see on the sign, is representing ACGIH. Right. Uh, well, I had my chance to give a background on our challenges. I just want to point out historically with ACGIH, it was uh, a foundation of governmental uh, industrial hygienists uh, uh, back in the 1930s, and it was exclusively to uh, examine available data to come up with a consensus uh, amongst professionals of what is a maximum tolerable level of inhalation of different chemicals. And, and these were called chemical uh, substances, uh, TLVs. And it wasn't until the 1960s, late 60s, that the Physical Agents Committee for ACGH was set up uh, to for noise, heat stress, uh, uh, magnetic fields, radio frequency, radiation, lasers, ultraviolet, infrared, and so forth. Uh, the AC, as I mentioned this morning, the ACGH uh, uh, TLV for UV hasn't uh, had not really changed for a half century, which could be two or three reasons. One is we didn't have any adverse uh, experiences that suggested that the numbers were wrong. Uh, number two, we thought it was quite conservative. It was not practical for outdoor workers to even uh, be uh, uh, get down to those levels unless they put on heavy uh, overalls and so forth. So uh, the, the one trigger to revise limits in the deep UV came from ophthalmologists using the argon fluoride eczema laser in the operating room for refractive eye surgery. And uh, as Dr. Chokal, who's now left for the day, he pointed out, they've had millions of patients uh, using this. And the doctors complained bitterly that the laser safety officers running around the hospital told them they had to wear goggles and do all this stuff. And they knew enough that <laughs> they weren't possibly ever getting an exposure that was potentially hazardous. Uh, but the laser safety limits were much more restrictive because we didn't know the exact wavelength uh, dependence. So it was just one flat number of three millijoules per square centimeter from about 308 down to uh, uh, 180 nanometers. So our first effort was to reevaluate the laser stuff, and we uh, uh, upgraded that limit about uh, 10 years ago, I'd say. Uh, and then, uh, even before COVID, there was some pressure from uh, people who were studying 222 nanometers and some other wavelengths uh, saying these limits seem too restrictive. And there was some uh, number of studies that were starting to be published about 19, uh, about 2018, 19, 20. And so we started working on this project before COVID started. But once COVID started, there was terrific pressure to come up with something which I would say uh, might uh, would have been considered premature had we not had COVID to push us. In hindsight, the, 
uh, we do realize we didn't have enough uh, action spectra data. And I want to emphasize that both ACGH limits and probably the ICNIRB limits will wait until we can get better action spectra. And uh, Paul Omani, who had a poster here, and I had a poster here, but we were both saying we need more refined action spectra data. And some of the researchers don't like me to say monochromators aren't satisfactory during the, in these steep areas like between 230 and 250 nanometers. And I was to, the, the most interesting, important thing I learned attending this meeting was that uh, this Danish company has a, a European Union uh, collaborative project to develop lasers, laser lines between, uh, I think it's 220, or maybe all the way from 200 down up to 250 nanometers. And so I'm very anxious to see some progress along that line. And I'm not trying to criticize that using monochromators are useless. They're absolutely not. But they give us a, uh, a lower resolution than we would like to have. And lasers allow us, if, cho if chosen properly, to get that. So from the uh, uh, non-governmental organization uh, voluntary guidelines side of things, uh, I would say uh, we need more uh, threshold data to, and also some studies on uh, at the molecular level, which is the only way we can go for knowing about long-term delayed effects. We need some those types of basic studies because we've got a problem trying to do an epidemiological study. There's, large, there's uh, over 100,000 arc welder uh, professionals in this country, for example, but they don't have problems with skin cancer and stuff from arc welding because they are fully protected. And we have very good compliance, as it's called in occupational health, that people comply with the rules of wearing face shields because if they don't, they'll get an immediate uh, and painful uh, evening uh, from a photokeratitis or welder's clash and, and a mild sunburn. So uh, we, we, we're not going to ever be able to get real epidemiological data. And, and it's well to remember that we're shielded by the ozone layer, so we don't have any long-term experience as we do with UVB and uh, UVA. Well, thank you, David. And last but not least, Bilal uh, from PNNL. Hi, uh, Bilal from PNNL. Um, I'm a Lion researcher, and since the pandemic started, we've been our team has been working on a variety of projects, um, mostly supported by DOE, Department of Energy, to promote the use of this technology. Mo the most of the most of our interest is really in this technology comes from the fact. Um, or from exploring its energy efficiency potential um, to complement other strategies, uh, other mitigation strategies, uh, like ventilation, filtration, and, and so forth. So we published a report uh, last year um, looking at or comparing different technologies, and we concluded that uh, GUV in general is, is, is effective and delivers uh, multiple uh, equivalent air changes per hour compared to other uh, strategies. I want to make clear that the part of DOE we're funded by does not get involved into the um, the regulatory aspects. Uh, there's other parts of DOE that do, uh, but we don't get into that aspect. Our role is really to kind of look at um, published educational pieces to advance uh, this technology moving forward. Maybe here I'll mention two main projects that we're currently working on. The first one is a series of field evaluations um, where we go to existing sites that have upper room or whole room UVC, evaluate them by taking radiometric measurements, um, looking at uh, measurements in the irradiated zone and in the uh, occupied zone to confirm safety and effectiveness of, of, of these installations. And we aim to publish those as a series of case studies um, to increase public's familiarity with this technology and hopefully increase its adoption. This, the second project is kind of a comeback from uh, what's called the Caliper project, when the LEDs were um, 
and coming up, this program was launched about a decade ago uh, to test commercially available LED products. This program is coming back now for um, GUV with complete testing of commercially available products, and there's a report that's going to be coming out soon. The main goal here is not to criticize certain products or to advocate for certain products. It's really to, to be educational, to help push the market forward. Um, so that's, I think, the, where, where PNL will, will focus on in the moment. Thank you, Bilal. And uh, now uh, let's come back to Aileen uh, and ask her to uh, talk about uh, the regulatory structure that does exist in the United States. We've asked her to start, or at least include uh, in her comments, a bit about the history and, and how we got to where we are. Yeah, so um, first and foremost, anything that kills, um, prevents, mitigates, um, or repels a pest is considered a pesticide. So that includes any microorganisms, including what UV light does, where it inactivates different microorganisms, and um, that would be considered a pesticide. Um, so all pesticides are regulated under uh, FIFRA, the Federal uh, Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Um, so this is an act where all um, pesticides that are sold or distributed in the United States uh, are regulated by the EPA. Um, so um, I've heard a lot of, of, of different ideas. All UV devices are regulated by the EPA. However, um, in 1976, there was a federal register notice and a rule that exempted devices from registration. So in, in a sense, a device is regulated, but not registered. Um, traditional pesticides, so the spray under your sink, the wipes that are used in hospital rooms, um, wipes that are used in schools are registered with the EPA. They have an EPA registration number. Uh, devices, and typically, because um, uh, there's always an exception, uh, typically UV lights are considered devices um, they're considered an instrument or contrivance um, that's used to prevent, mitigate, repel, or kill a pest. Um, so a lot has changed um, since 1976. Um, devices have become um, a, a hot button issue at EPA, uh, particularly in my office. Um, and it kind of started with the pandemic. We started seeing more and more devices coming through. Um, so one of the main things that EPA regulates is misbranding and false and misleading claims. So on a pesticide, um, which includes UV lights, you can't have any false or misleading claims. Um, so that will take the form in many different ways. Um, and we have specifically defined terms. So for example, uh, disinfection is um, in EPA guidelines for registered pesticides and has a very particular meaning. Um, there are specific organisms that have to be killed at a specific rate. Um, typically, it's 99.99% .99 reduction rate uh, to have the disinfection claim. If the number doesn't match disinfection, um, our guidelines, we would consider the product um, false or misleading. Um, So um, as, as I stated before, um, FIFRA is all about what is sold or distributed. Um, so anytime it enters the channels of trade, that's when you can come into contact with how your product has to be regulated. Um, all, UV, um, all devices need to be made in an EPA establishment location. Um, this, for all intents and purposes, this is a paperwork exercise. Um, you need to do some minor reporting um, for how many devices are made. Um, but this also includes where things are relabeled. So for example, if you have a UV light and you want to put a new claim on it and you put a sticker over an old claim, uh, that would be considered um, a part of manufacturing and that would need to happen at an EPA establishment location. Um, I think I hit all of the things. Um, the one thing that will push you to have your product registered is if you're sold with a substance. Um, so this is typically some sort of substance that works uh, chemically. Um, and if you are sold with a substance, the whole product 
becomes a pesticide requiring registration. Um, so it's it's a complicated landscape um, that uh, can be difficult to navigate, um, but help is here. Um, I am actually the person you contact if you have questions about your particular product. Um, so it's, I hope everyone can see it. It's my email is heffernan.aileen at epa.gov. Thank you, Aileen. Uh, and th thank you again for being here. Uh, you had touched on something that uh, had, has been brought up several times uh, since uh, the beginning of the, of the conference, uh, the 99.9% uh, issue. Uh, and could you just give us a minute or two about, uh, in more detail about whether that's grounded in legislation or policy and the implications uh, of that issue? Yeah, so disinfection, sanitization, and sterilization are defined in EPA guidelines. So these guidelines are typically used uh, for registered pesticides, so your liquid product that um, is under your sink in hospitals, wherever, if there's a place that needs disinfecting, you know, that's where it would be. Um, and in our guidelines, we have defined um, disinfection as 99.99% reduction, sanitization as 99.9, and then uh, sterilization is a extremely high bar, and I forget how many nines are involved, just a lot of, six, six, a lot of nines, a lot of them. Um, so those are all defined by our, our, our guidelines. Um, but when something comes in through a port, um, we have offices around every EPA region uh, is in every state and all ports of importation get notified when there's a pesticide involved. Um, and our regulators, depending on the state you're in and the region you're in, um, are very keyed in disinfection means 99.9% um, and we'll look at particular products to make sure that they match. Um, that's one of the main things that, that we talk about um, uh, with the regions um, about how, uh, what disinfection means, what sanitization means, what sterilization means. Um, and they're very specifically defined within our guidelines that are used for registered pesticides. So it sounds like it's grounded in policy and guidelines. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure if we'll be allowed to go over, but uh, we do have some time for questions or comments. And if the panelists are okay with that, then why don't we do so? Shelly was the first one with her hand up. Thank you, Aline. Um, so did the ionization products ever get in trouble for mislabeling of their devices? So that's uh, bipolar ionization? Correct. Yes. Uh, I've seen those in a variety of, of ways. So the way products come to me are really one of two ways. Uh, one is they're stopped at a port of entry and the regions flag it uh, for enforcement. And the other way is the agency has um, a fee-for-service system where um, different products can come in and get an official determination. And as a courtesy, it involves a label review. So sometimes we'll see bipolar ionization come in through that route as well. So can a citizen call you and say they're claiming XYZ and it's not true? Can you look at it? Like, how does yes. this work? Okay. So you can. We have an enforcement portal. Wonderful. Um, okay. Uh, follow up with me after, I'll give you the website and everything. <laughs> okay, and in the middle here. Um, very nice to meet you, Eileen. Uh, you are one of the few person at uh, EPA that I probably haven't talked to and complained to. But uh, uh, I have a simple question. Is there any chance that the EPA will one day uh, recognize that 254 nanometer and 222 nanometer are germicidal wavelengths and meaning a lamp that emits 254 nanometer can be called a germicidal lamp? Because today that's not the case. If I don't have test data of a lamp, that emits 254 nanometer, I cannot call it germicidal. So 
one of the uh, ways that FIFRA works is that it's on the product specifically. Um, so for example, um, I've worked on a number of hydrogen peroxide products. Efficacy data for one hydrogen peroxide product uh, can be very different than another hydrogen peroxide product, even if they have the same amount of active ingredients. Um, so because we are so route, uh, deeply entrenched in how typical pesticides are, are regulated and registered, we would see each UV device as its own individual product requiring its own individual data. Um, it can get a little confusing when you have different parts. So if you have a UV bulb making claims, those claims would need to be um, supported by data. And then as soon as that bulb gets uh, into a device, that device would also need data. So I understand that there's a I can throw two cartons of mercury lamps in a sewer. They will not kill one bacteria. I have to put them in a device. So uh, regulating lamps as devices and then asking the manufacturer to provide germicidal data for a lamp doesn't make sense to me. So it would really depend on what's being sold or distributed. So if that lamp is not making any claims and claiming germicidal UV, that germicidal is what would put it into the realm of pesticides. So if it's just a UV light that's being sold or distributed that's not making any claims, then that would likely not be regulated by FIFRA. Um, however, um, if it is making claims, it would be. And that's kind of where the distinction lies. It's what the intent and what's being said on the product. Okay, thank you. We'll move to the next question. I'm just curious for the uh, sanitization and disinfection log kill that you were talking about. Is that the same for FDA devices? No, um, they have a, a different framework, and unfortunately, I'm not um, familiar enough with it to speak on the topic. Yes, and we did invite uh, the National Academies invited uh, FDA to be here today, but they were unable uh, to do so. Hopefully, they'll be present in the future. Next question. Uh, yeah, um, so my company sells quite a few uh, UV lamps to various OEMs in the water, air, and uh, surface application markets. And it's felt a lot of them are afraid to interface with you folks because they don't want to get in trouble and they have questions, but they don't want to ask questions because they're afraid about getting in trouble and having to modify everything. So it's sort of this negative feedback loop. So as kind of an intermediary, um, for example, uh, is there a good resource for terminology that the EPA accepts in manuals, in marketing claims? Because um, I have, I'm not going to name names, but I've, I had some OEMs over the last two years get just totally devastated and shut down for months on end because of the use of, like Holger said, germicidal. And instead of fighting it, they just stripped all the useful information out of their documentation. And it, it was honestly pretty sad. So is there a way to interface without risk of, of blowing up your, your, your company so yes yes there is we are not uh, the epa does not intend to ever destroy a company we don't want to ruin your business um but we do want to make sure that there are no false or misleading claims so there are a few ways you can do this we have a few uh, compliance advisories that are out and available uh, we have another a uh, few other resources and um you're always welcome to submit, um, we call them M009. It's a RFP for service program. Um, and with that, you would have to, it's again, remember this is the government. Um, you would have to request a determination on your product and a courtesy label review. And we will go through your label and look at the claims that you make um, both on the label in anything that's um, included with the product and at times on websites. Yeah, just one quick caveat to that. Um, last last week at the meetings that we held on uh, ASHRAE headquarters in, in Atlanta, um, the differentiation between sterilization, sanitation, and disinfection, I think most of us can agree here that using the term sterilization is probably not the, the a correct term to use, but it, it, I was shocked to hear that some companies got in trouble for using the term disinfection which was sort of disappointing. So I guess uh, later on, maybe I'll, I'll try to catch you and get more information on maybe best terms that OEMs that I work with can use so that they don't end up getting in trouble. 
more common, I guess, than a question, but thanks. Thank you. The gentleman in front of you said his hand up for quite a while. Yeah. So, yes. Uh -huh. You just need a microphone and you can speak loud. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. There's more of a kind of a diffuse question just in terms of the recognition of the regulatory agencies, which has obviously been doing great work and been really busy through these last few years. From a physician's perspective, you know, is there that recognition of what a super weapon that this really is? When I hear problems, you know, at this conference, uh, not being a physicist, I still look at it and I'm, what I'm seeing is optimizations are possible. But when you compare it on a graph against, you know, we were just referencing um, antibiotics and antibiotic resistance, that's inevitable. People are dying every year, many, from our antibiotics. And so when people are coming to me, I'm intubating these COVID patients, what have you, we don't have a lot of great tools, and we know that pretty well anything that's developed in the pharmaceutical industry is going to be obsolete within a you know relatively short period of time before TB and all these others then develop their superbugs. So, with that said, just wondering if if we're keeping in mind the overall goal of this public health policy of prevention and wanting to work with this technology to make it grow, and and not try to put an over uh, an overburdensome regulatory environment on it. One comment that I do want to make is that, um, you know, we were discussing the 99.9% net, but there is no tool that everybody can agree on that that's how it's done. And without a documentary standard <clears throat> saying this is how we're going to run the biological test, that a third party and a fourth party and a fifth party can perform the same thing to get the same answer, sort of a moot point in some ways. Um, I will tell you about in the solid state lightning world, in the history, you know, it's companies were making claims, there wasn't any regulation, but the FTC couldn't do anything about it until there was a standard. And as soon as there was a standard, then the companies were like, oh, I see. And then they stopped doing that. So there's, <clears throat> you need the tools to move forward on some of these things. We just don't have the tools yet. Yeah, Cameron, you took the words out of my mouth. So, um, you know, Aileen is tasked with figuring out what a false and misleading claim is when there's a lack of standards. It's very difficult when things are tested a million different ways to understand what is a false and misleading claim, particularly when things are tested under idealized lab conditions, and then you're trying to extrapolate those findings to, you know, the applied setting. So. It's a it's a really challenging environment to be working in, and I the the hope that I see is that there is a big movement towards standards, and there's already been a call to action today to for folks to participate, and I think that's the key, you know, one of the key things that we can do all together, government, industry, academia, to move this whole industry forward is to coalesce and agree on standards, and then it will be much easier to understand what a false and misleading claim is. Yes, and David mentioned this uh, earlier. So maybe a question for all of us is, you know, what uh, type of uh, safety processes should be in place? Uh, you know, we, we start at baseline with market forces, which exist, of course, now. Uh, and then we have standards and guidelines. And then at the other end of the spectrum uh, is legislation uh, upon which uh, regulations are built. So. I'm not offering an opinion. I'm saying maybe we should be thinking about that. Um, thank you very much. I'm just picking up on that standards and testing because I, I really liked Catherine's um, testing setup. Although I, I'm also more for the steady state because um, it's obviously because that's the <laughs> that, um, having learned from Kath. Um, I, I guess I would make a plea that as much as possible that's across. A sort of international agreement if, if the various standards bodies can can agree on that i've seen a draft for a german standard which i believe is coming out uh, where they have an incredibly large room i think it's 125 meters cubed or something like that to, to test different air filtration and um uv measurements and stuff and the the idea of it being a large room is it gets around the short circuiting that you can have with some of these kind of filtration units and is there is there collaboration work that goes on internationally when, when it comes to setting these standards 
So not internationally with the EU. However, my office does work um, collaboratively with Canada, uh, who has recently developed um, and required registration of, of different devices. Um, I haven't heard recently uh, if there's been any, if they have a registered UV product, um, but we do meet regularly with our colleagues in Canada. Um, and we're working on um, maybe not harmonizing because, you know, I don't know if we would be able to do that, um, but we, we are very aware of what's happening um, to our friendly neighbor in the North. What happened during the pandemic is that you, you couldn't sell a, uh, a UV uh, product in Canada because uh, you couldn't get it registered. And if you wanted to try to register it, they didn't really tell you what kind of organism you had to test it against, et cetera. So it became a real barrier to even applying UV in the Canadian space. And I think this is one of the, the barriers where regulation kind of the perfect is trying to drive out maybe the good that could be done. So I think standardization is really the way to go. Regulation, maybe not so much. Yeah, I, I was going to add that based upon everything that we've heard at this meeting, I would say the conclude the logical conclusion is that it's probably premature to put any regulatory standard on efficacy. Uh, it's a pity that uh, uh, Dr. Nardell had to leave early, but he would say, look, when you're trying to save lives, a vaccine that's only 50% effective is in great demand. And the idea that you have to have more than 90% uh, uh, reduction seems ludicrous from that viewpoint. And, that, and so it depends if we listen to the uh, commercial uh, talks this morning, a cost is a reality. And whether somebody wants to do something and they may not be able to afford what we would love to see them have, but any little bit still helps. So I think it's it defies easy uh, standardization, let alone regulation, to come up with efficacy standards. That's the challenge I see. It's not like in the clean water thing where you can actually achieve very, very high disinfection rates and because you have intense levels in a, in a conduit. And this is not the case. It depends so much on how the geometry of the room is and whether the installers take into account where the ventilation is and all these factors. So it's trying to standardize something that may not have much relevance it seems like a waste of money to me so if i can comment um, on that part of why we apply um, conventional guidelines and terms to devices um, is to prevent confusion we wouldn't want somebody who uses um, a registered product that has efficacy data on file that shows that it kills 99.99% of um, very specifically listed bacteria, virus, um, and different types of fungi compared to some uh, UV device that's making the same claims but doesn't have the same rigorous standards that the liquid disinfectants have um, or the registered products. So that's kind of where we're coming from is we want to avoid confusion um, for the people who are using these types of products. Take one more question from Paul, and then out of respect for time, I think we'll end yeah, it. Th thank you very much. And uh, because I was confused, I didn't put any details in, in one of my slides about the uh, EPA regs. But my understanding is sterilization is six nines, disinfection is five nines, and sanitization is three nines. Uh, and uh, Cameron has a great point about tests. And what some labs are doing, and, and I, you, you don't have to give me an official answer on this, but it's just for, for discussion, is some biological labs are doing a modified ASTM test, the same one that essentially they'd use for liquid disinfectants, and they'll put the uh, the UV lamp. I'm not calling it germicidal. <laughs> don't call it germicidal. <laughs> they'll put the UV lamp 
anywhere from inches to a couple feet from the coupon and showing, oh, yeah, we can get, you know, five nines of uh, disinfection. Uh, but that has nothing to do with, with what David was talking about, you know, with the, its application in a room. So how do we uh, deal, and this is more the, the big picture, from the standpoint of uh, consensus standards so that it's meaningful to both the consumer it also pushes the not just the manufacturer but the installation company and everybody else to doing it right over yeah so thank you that's um, actually a very common problem that we see um, every so often um, we get data from different companies and they'll test uv in like a closet and then tell me that it's for a huge room and they'll put the huge room on their label, but they've only tested in this like half of closet <laughs> size space. Um, and in my personal opinion, um, one way to get around that would be to actually register UV products, hold them to the same standards as liquid disinfectants, um, and then have guidelines so everyone would be doing the same thing, but that would involve rulemaking um, from the EPA's part, um, which is very resource intensive. So right now we can't say we, we will register uh, devices, um, including UV, but including um, ozone, including um, some different types of generators. Um, but with that said, we are moving forward. I'm gonna, do you mind if I end with some good news? Please. Okay. Uh, we are going to be doing a rule clarification, so there will be a chance for this whole group to provide feedback um, on a clarification uh, that we're making to the 1976 FRN. Uh, we're going to be talking about specifically about uh, photocatalytics, including titanium dioxide and generators, um, particularly um, hypochlorous acid generators that are sold with salt. Um, and we're still in the beginning phases of that, but there will be a chance um, for different groups, including groups like this, to provide comments to the government on, on how different devices are regulated uh, by, by the agency. Thank you on that positive note, thank you very much.